You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Chagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. My name is Shagun Yedele, and I am calling today and speaking to you from Kelowna uh, on the UBC Okanagan campus in the territories of the Silk Okanagan nations. And as usual, uh, I have Claudia with me. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Shagan. Hi, everyone. And I'm joining you from the UBC Point Grey campus in Vancouver on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam Nation. And with us today, we have someone who needs little introduction. Um, welcome, Jen Gunter. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Dr. Jen Gunter. Um, I'm a, a Winnipeg trained OBGYN. I live currently in the Bay Area in San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, Sunnyvale, which uh, <laughs> is, is exactly how it's the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, and um, I'm uh, the author of uh, the new book, Blood, the Science, Medicine and Mythology of Menstruation. What a great book. So I had the pleasure of reading it this weekend and your voice shines through as it always does. Um, your ability to balance the science with um, the science communication and the myth busting um, is not only fun, but also highly educational. Um, I think I first came across you on social media in what you have uh, sort of called a seminal Jen Gunther moment, which is when you debunked Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, sort of assertion that putting jade eggs into one's vagina was a good idea. Um, is that where you got started with the myth busting or was that just on the way? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a path, that was a point along the way where people noticed, but no, I'd been doing it for quite some time. I'd actually became interested in it in residency. Uh, you know, there were myths about about women's bodies about you know tampons having asbestos back when i was a medical student and uh you know back then a lot of those myths were like in readers digest and places like that so they didn't like go around so quickly and um uh, you know, I just, I, you know, as social media became a bigger thing, um, it really became apparent how, you know, myths and mythology was great clickbait, right? And even in national publications online, you know, it's, those are the things that get clicks. And so I just, I, you know, began to thinking about, you know, all the people coming into my office and the things that they believed and, you know, how that came to be a combination of, you know, lack of good education about the human body, especially about, you know, bodies that menstruate, um, systematic patriarchy, and clickbait, um, and also kind of the rise of big natural, you know, which is another arm of the patriarchy, really. Yeah, that's um, very interesting. And from your book, you know, you, you, you write that it's, it, medicine was created for men, you know, and so right. men um, sort of kind of owned that space and defined that space uh, for their for their own purposes and blamed women and so on. Um, and and I just wanted to, to for you to expand on that in your studies. Would you agree that that's not? It became transcultural. That is, it's not just like a European or Western thing. It's actually uh, something that exists throughout culture, wherever human beings uh, found themselves, as you as you said, uh, can you speak more to that? Yeah, I mean, there definitely are some cultures that are more matriarchal, um, but certainly in the West, uh, very patriarchal. But I, I think in many places, and it's hard to pin how that all came about because. Most religions, um, most popular religions are patriarchal, right? And, um, you know, so it's, it, you know, colonizations had a massive impact there as well. And so I think tracing how it, how it all 
sort of became like this is difficult. I mean, you know, we're now starting to see, for example, and I'm not an expert in this area, but anthropological evidence that women were hunters, right? So obviously, at some point in time, women were out there, you know, slogging away, just like the men. And so I think that um, when that that became this sort of um, this different tract, uh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not the expert there, but certainly I would say that many, many cultures, but again, there are cultures that are more matriarchal. There are cultures also that respect elders more than, you know, than a typical Western society. So I think there are definitely places where it's less of an issue and places where it's more of an issue. Absolutely. And I agree with you. So I'm originally from uh, Africa, West Africa, and Nigeria, to be specific. And there are certain of the tribes uh, that are in Nigeria that are very matriarchal. And um, and they're really well known and very adored. Really, it's like a wonder that this tribe, like um, Amazons, that these women are really a group of women that take ownership of everything except their reproduction. <laughs> oh. You know, it, it's really curious to me that when it comes to that, they still fall back to what the men think about, oh, maybe they don't have children or this and that. And, and that's really, it's such a powerful um, evolutional, ev evolutionary thing, as you describe. And, and that even in this, that in this area, even for women that are very, you know, very, um, own, they own everything about their bodies and themselves, except in this area. So it's just interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I it's the commodification of reproduction, right? That um, that that's you know historically, I think, been viewed as a commodity. If you can make more children, you can have more people to work your land. You can have more family to help you. You can, you know, like I think, you know, that that's been part of you know how you know perpetuating the family name, like however you look at it. So so you can see how that becomes part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating to look at, at all the different inflection points. Um, and then, you know, also to also look at the impact of, you know, how religions had an impact and all of those things. So when you're looking at the, um, a woman's body, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about what how we define woman in this conversation, because um, not every woman has a uterus. Um, you know, there are many gender identities and, um, but when we're looking at sort of the way that uh, women's reproductive um, selves, bodies have been instrumentalized by society and othered them and made them feel shame. Um, I, I find that is something that really shines through in all of your books that um, there's nothing to be ashamed of, um, and that the sense of othering and shaming is a way to control women's bodies. Um, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, knowledge is power. It really is. And, and whether it's knowledge about your body, knowledge about finances, knowledge about, you know, agriculture, like knowledge is power. And the best way to keep people from knowledge is to make it shameful to get it, right? So if you can make, you know, make women ashamed that their very physiology is dirty, is toxic, is polluting, which is a very like, again, not in every culture, but in many cultures with many diverse backgrounds, you see this common thread, you know, that, that, you know, menstruating women have to leave the house, that they can pollute something. You, you know, you see that in so many different walks of life, so many different cultures that, um, that's a great way to control someone, you know, that, that if your very physiology, your very like being is wrong, then of course you're, you know, if that's how you're brought up, that's going to have such an impact on you in so many ways. You're not going to question, you're, you're less likely to question, you're less likely to to advocate, you may not even know the concept of self-advocacy applies to you, right? Like if you've never been able to, you know, own land until relatively recently, how can you even have this concept of self-advocacy? Like, I mean, obviously there were incredible women through history who have stood up, but think about all the forces, right? That they were like, they're going against. So, you know, if you want to control people, I think it's making their whole essence dirty, toxic, shameful. And it's not just shameful. It's like, I always say like, to be 
how a woman has been treated in history is sort of be like on the edge of a knife, right? If you have sex before marriage, you know, you're a slut, you're dirty, you're nasty. But then if you can't reproduce enough, you're useless, you're worth, you're worthless, you know, so it's like, you have to walk this sort of like very narrow definition, and you fall off on either edge, and there's something wrong with you. And then, you know, you become menopausal, and then you're you're useless because you can't reproduce anymore. And so who even wants to talk about that? So, so yeah, I mean, the, the systematic shaming, so people don't, so they think their very essence is wrong. I, I feel is a very effective weapon of control. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And um, it's interesting how the lack of knowledge has been replaced by a sort of mythology uh, around the human body. And uh, we've talked previously with um, Adam Taylor, who did a study. He's a prof in the UK. And he did a study looking at how much people knew about their bodies. Like, do they know where the liver is, where the heart is? And people don't. Mm -hmm. Like, There is just a complete lack of knowledge about... Uh, people's own bodies. Now, of course, we take it for granted as people who know anatomy quite thoroughly, um, but many people don't know. And when it comes to something as intimate as um, your own sort of physiology, your menstruation, the changes in your body during puberty and then during menopause, this lack of knowledge gets replaced by a mythology. And you've really set out to bust a lot of those myths. Um, Tell us about your pathway towards that and some of your maybe the biggest myths and the most disturbing <laughs> ones that you found. Yeah, I mean, so for me, this mythology is especially damaging because one, I mean, we have the knowledge, we don't need it anymore. But two, a lot of it is patriarchy in disguise. And that's really, really concerning to me. So, you know, all of these things are written in ancient texts, you know, that, you know, people say, oh, well, women had recipes for this or that, or they could do this. Well, well, no, actually, everything that was written in a text was written by a man. I mean, or 99.9% .9 of it was. And, you know, men thought women were dirty, or they thought they were witches, or they thought they were, you know, you know, whatever they thought they were. So, you know, men thought women were going to put spells on them, all kinds of awful things. So you can't take what was historically written. Um, and I think that this sort of grasping at mythology is this sort of false way to reclaim your body, but it's really carrying water for the patriarchy because mythology doesn't serve anybody. Knowledge is what serves you. And it's very alarming because there's such a, a modern mixing of mythology with wellness, with supplements, with alternative medicine. And it's a pathway really to very dangerous beliefs about your body. And when you look at wellness, it's all purity culture. It's a return to pure, clean, natural, unspoiled. You know, if you look at what medicine was like, you know, pre like 1800s, it was kind of religion, medicine and religion were kind of the same, like we didn't know, you know, didn't know it germs, we know about much, you know. And so there was a lot of ancient therapies were about purification, were about returning to the natural state, balancing humors. And we've seen, you know, medicine, as we know it, evidence based medicine branch off from that and be like, Oh, hey, there's germs. Oh, hey, there's things we need to study. And then we've seen this sort of sticking along that pathway with many naturopaths, many alternative medicine providers, really practicing what would be I would consider 1750s medicine without the bloodletting, um, you know, doing giving all kinds of therapies that make no sense, um, that sound like they're rooted in, in ancient beliefs. And, you know, we don't, we don't have ancient cars, you know, we don't have ancient phones. We, we don't, we don't fetishize ancient in many other ways. And so I think it's really important for people to understand that this return to natural, all of these things are really, really very patriarchal and, it's it they're very like a soft sell into some really dangerous myths like, like anti-vaccine myths um, fears about hormonal contraception fears of you know you name it fears about modern medicine um so as the phenotypic man here <laughs> <laughs> i'm wondering about um what the response has been like if i play a little bit of a devil devil's advocate and i say people and i can imagine people say oh you're just men bashing you're just you're just uh you know 
kind of making men feel they're worthless and all of that in a way and i think it's for me speaking for myself i think it's well deserved <laughs> given a lot of harm that people have done over the years but i'm just saying how do you respond to that and how has how have men typically responded to your work well so first of all i would say i'd like to think i'm not man bashing and i'm patriarchy bashing and they're different things and i would say the patriarchy harms good men as well as women um because i know lots of really good men and they're the ones who you know, aren't putting these awful laws out there. They aren't the ones out there lying to people about their bodies, but their voices don't rise in a patriarchy, right? So I would say the patriarchy hurts good men as well. Um, and certainly I'm, I'm, I'm married to an amazing good man who, you know, if he were making all the rules, yeah, yeah. if he were a politician, I would keep telling him, you should be a politician. He's like, oh God, no, but you know what I mean? So, so I think that that's what I was like to focus on is that it's really, it's really the systematic rule that's been there for a very long time. And it's very harmful to everybody. It's harmful to children. It's harmful to women. It's harmful to men. And there are some people, some women and some men who co-opt the patriarchy for their use or thrive within it. And then there's others like you and and lots of other good men who are trying to undo it. I couldn't agree more. And, and I thank you really for that lovely observation uh, that patriarchy harms everybody, uh, <laughs> including including the, the men, you know, and, and, but for my, the second part of my question, though, I, I do not know, have you got any responses in terms of like positive feedback from guys who say, look, I love, like, I would say, I love your work. I love that you are enlightening and bringing this knowledge to people. Yeah, no, I do. I mean, I have lots of men who have bought um, reach out to me and tell me they bought the Vagina Bible or bought the Menopause Manifesto so they could learn more about what was happening to their spouse. In fact, you know, I've had men reach out to me and say, my wife is going through menopause. She will not talk about it. And so I decided that I would get educated on the subject. And I'm just like, wow, what a good partner. What a really good partner. Um, I've had single dads and gay dads say, I've got, a, I've got a daughter and I don't know how all of this works and I don't want her to be affected by the patriarchy. So I bought the vagina Bible to read up about it. And I mean, I think that's amazing. Uh, and, you know, I, I have a lot of really great champions who are men who are just, you know, here for the science and the facts, and they appreciate how the systematic patriarchy affects everybody. And, you know, there's a few men who, you know, who, who are, you know, who, who are snarky to me, but I would actually say it's more women, interestingly. And I think that's the impact of internalized misogyny, um, that, that it's more women who say angry things, um, that I'm a man basher, uh, you know, or that, you know, of being pure, wanting, wanting to be pure, clean and natural isn't patriarchal. And I'm just like, Whoa, <laughs> those words are really loaded, you know? That's really interesting. Um, and I think it has to do with that sort of fear of change. As much as we suffer under the patriarchy, it's also comfortable because we're used to it. Um, and um, not that I'm comfortable with it. I want to make that very clear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for in general. society writ large, right? Yes, yes. Um, change is hard. Change is hard. And taking it back to women's bodies, women's bodies go through dramatic change throughout a lifetime. And you, in your many years of practice, have sort of seen these changes in so many women um, as they come in, as they sort of reach puberty, uh, accompanying them through their reproductive years, as they're called, which is a little bit reductionist, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then um, as they approach menopause. Um, I want you to tell us all about this because this has been the subject of now three books that you've written um, and you have such insight into these changes. Yeah, no, first of all, I think, and I agree, I think we should be calling it like the menstrual years or the ovulatory years and not the reproductive years. It's so, it's, if, you know, words change how you think about things. They really do. This has been well studied. And so, you know, this idea then, if we call it the reproductive years, then, then we're distilling, 
your whole experience down to producing the next generation versus it's menstruation. It's why not call it the menstrual years? Like that seems to me to be the thing. So um, because, you know, we call it menopause, which is the end of menstruation. So we have menses in that word. So, yeah, I mean, and it's also, you know, interesting as an OBGYN, your population tends to age a little bit with you because people tend, you know, in in general, this is obviously a gross generalization, but, you know, your patients stick with you. They start younger. I have a specialty practice, so it's a little bit less of that. You know, people float in and out of my practice. So I see people of all ages. But, yeah, it's really interesting the whole the lack of knowledge across the whole menstrual lifespan uh, is um, is really astounding. And I would say that as little as people know about their menstrual cycle and about their physiology between, you know, the ages of say, you know, 15 and 42, 43, they know even less about menopause because that's kind of like the last taboo. Because if your only worth is reproduction, in a patriarchal society, then when you can't reproduce anymore, you know, off to the hinterlands, you know, you're, you know, get, you know, go sit in a corner and, and, you know, and, and be quiet. Uh, And so it's really this whole, I find this awful intersection of ageism and misogyny, right? That um, in our society, very, very Western, because I think many other societies are a little bit more accepting of women as they age as having knowledge, right? But very Western concept of, you know, you lose your value. And, um, and we, you know, we know that's simply, you know, not true. And, you know, we all accumulate knowledge as we age. But yeah, it's a, you know, the, the systematic erasing of, you know, of aging in women um, is a pretty, it's a pretty pervasive thing in the West. I think it's very damaging too. And, you know, I, I feel it reflected back from my patients and, you know, I, I get patients thanking me for having gray hair. I mean, that's really sad when you think about it, right? Like it's, it's sad that that is where we're at. Um, And I mean, and it's sad that it was really hard for me to go gray. It was really hard. Actually, I call it titanium. I call it gray. Let's call it titanium. We need to, we need to remarket it. So it's just, those things are sad. And then you realize how, you know, we're all affected. That's really interesting. I mean, the graying of hair just as an outward sign of, um, of aging, of being out of the menstrual years. Um, And of course, you know, skin changes and all of that. And I mean, there's a whole huge industry, obviously, um, to combat all of that from hair dye to whatever products people put onto their faces to um, continue that fountain of youth um, and to continue to have that worth uh, in society or perceived worth. Um, When we go back to the physiology of the body, um, menopause is uh, an exciting change. I mean, I'm I love these changes in bodies. I love children in puberty. I find it's those are really wonderful and exciting years in a um, in a youth's life, in a person's life, um, where that are defining um, as they you know grow into their own bodies and discover things about themselves and about society and all of that. Now, when we take that to the menopausal years, um, how do you position those changes in the body, that physiology? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a scientific level, it's super cool. It's this idea that, you know, all species, all mammals anyway, um, have a have a limited number of, of follicles of eggs. And um, the the difference, and I and I really wish more people knew this, is that the the difference is some keep on living past reproduction, and some don't. And humans are one of the few groups that keep living past reproduction. Killer whales are another well studied group, and it's uh, and they apparently have quite a matriarchal society as well. Uh, and my understanding is also the male killer whales die much earlier. So it's, it's, it's a very fascinating, um, very fascinating from that standpoint, but yeah, I think it's, it's really fascinating. And, and I think that I wish more people could view that as a sign of strength. Like imagine being so strong that you're able to keep living where that doesn't happen with other species, right? Like that's, that's a rebranding. Now, whether that's completely scientifically accurate is different, but 
you know, I think that that we can use a little bit of rebranding, but it's really, it's a fascinating physiology. And if you look at, you know, the, the evolutionary belief behind it, and it's a hypothesis, obviously, but that, you know, that, that women in menopause had worth to society, because you always think like from an evolutionary standpoint, like you're, you're benefiting passing on genetics, like that's, the end game. And you might be benefiting it by helping to build more shelter. You might be benefiting it by actually reproducing. There's all different kinds of ways you can contribute beyond your genetics. And it's this idea that when there was a, a grandmother in the, in the household, that was useful. And if you think about it, you know, having somebody else who's not encumbered with child rearing themselves, who's invested in, you know, helping That'd be great, right? Like that having an extra pair of hands is very useful. And it turns out, you know, that, that, you know, it's the wise woman hypothesis that you, that you bring this knowledge of creating shelter, of gathering food, of being very active. And, um, you know, it's always funny too, how many people think about this sort of like end being just related to women, but it's like, well, it's not, you know, every both women and men live beyond, you know, that's age and there isn't like a difference. And so obviously both are contributing in some way to society if they're able to keep living historically. Um, so yeah, I just wish more people would know that menopause isn't a sign that you're done from evolution's perspective. It's a sign that you still have a lot of things to offer. So less of an expiry date and more of a transition date. Exactly. Like it's the new, it's the next great adventure. And it doesn't mean that there aren't troubling symptoms, but it's fascinating to me that we can talk about pregnancy in a way that's, well, that's great that you're pregnant. That's fantastic. And still acknowledge that people have bad, um, some people can have bad experiences. Some people can have terrible nausea and vomiting. Some people can have serious complications in pregnancy. Pregnancy is not a walk in the park for everybody that people can go through puberty and have bad experiences. They can have terrible acne. They can develop depression. And we're able to still talk about those things in ways that aren't, you know, derivative or that, that aren't like, you know, derogatory. And so we should think about that same framework for menopause. We can, we can hold space for people who have symptoms and hold space to have those treatments, but also understand that it's not the beginning of the end. I like your emphasis on the science of, uh, menstruation, menopause, and so on in your book. And as scientists herself, it's, I think it's really educational. And I really love that you follow that approach. You, you give the diagrams and the, you know, everything that, um, that uh, for me is, as an anatomist, I think I, I find it really, really good. Um, so that brings me to this fad. I don't know whether it's a fad, maybe it's always been there for people liking organic things and people wanting natural products and so on. And you mentioned some of that in your book too, about some of the myths of menstruation and how people, you know, um, how people use products that actually can be harmful, harmful uh, for them. Um, and I wonder whether you want to just talk to, to that a little bit about those myths that, that surround menstruation and how they're not helpful at all. Right. So again, you know, natural is purity culture and, you know, nature's trying to kill us, you know, I mean, if you're in Calgary right now, it's like minus 30, like nature's trying to kill you. Uh, nature doesn't care. Um, and so this idea about return to natural is not, you know, it, it's not scientific in any way. You want things that are studied and are safe and every single person in science can list off something that's natural in their field. That's really bad. Right. So, I wish people understood that this return to natural is marketing, it's propaganda. A lot of the marketing comes from companies selling these products, right? So you should think about a company selling, for example, an organic menstrual pad, just as you would a pharmaceutical company. You should think about them the same way. You should think of their messaging the same way. And it gets back to clickbait fears about women's bodies make copy. So when you see these ridiculous claims about whatever in menstrual products going viral, you know, it's because the fear about not being able to reproduce is this patriarchal sort of like 
It's just in the ethos. It's everywhere. And we don't realize how much we're all steeping in it. So I think like if your mother and her mother and her mother back to like the beginning of time were judged by their ability to reproduce, right? That has to have a effect on us collectively. And so, so I think that it ties into that very primal fear for a lot of people that you're, you know, you're poisoning your body. You might not be able to reproduce all these sort of things. And yeah, I mean, none of these things are based in any scientific thing. That's what's so ludicrous is that these myths come out and you're like, it's based on something written by a company that sells the products or, you know, by somebody who's very invested in fear about, um, about products. And so, you know, there's all kinds of big funding and all I could tell people is propaganda works. You hear it over and over again. That's why people use it. It's again, going back to this concept of control over uh, a woman's body, uh, control over their fertility by instilling fear uh, around fertility and uh, purity, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I find that Western sort of linkage of purity and fertility um, is quite disturbing. And you address it in the book as well. And I know that um, we address it in the classroom as well, just some of the um, nomenclature around um, the pelvis and perineum mm -hmm. with the pudendal nerve, which of course means the shameful nerve uh, and all of that really uh, very patriarchal mm -hmm. nomenclature for that area. Um, how do we move forward from here? I mean, you have, of course, been a trailblazer in terms of um, educating folks um, and really emphasizing the science and a commitment to myth busting and calling people out for their um, creation of mythology in the service of capitalism and patriarchy, quite frankly. Um, what can we do to amplify this and to, um, to change the world? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that you're incredibly right about like, you know, all the namings of things. I mean, even like estrogen is like, like gadfly, like, you know, you're a sexual gadfly. Like, it's just so like, it's so awful. And I think probably a hundred years ago, doctors understood what all those Latin terms meant, but I think probably now they don't. Although I still, I would still be in favor of renaming everything. Although I don't think that's probably going to have the same impact it might've had maybe 80 years ago. Right. But I still think you sometimes just have to do something because it's the right thing to do. Right. Just to say like going forward, we'll put a line in the sand that we're only going to use like, you know, words that have biological value, you know, or that, you know. Um, so I think you know, insisting on education, trying to get more education. I think that it's, it's sad that people graduate from high school, probably with more knowledge about frog biology than they do about human biology. And I no shame to comparative animal physiology at all. Um, I studied it in school, it's super important. And, you know, I, you know, but I think that school isn't just about preparing you to go to college, right? Or university schools about preparing you for life. And, and wouldn't it be better to have a greater understanding of your physiology? And unfortunately, in many schools, we teach it in related to sex ed, like as an, oh, just don't have sex or, or, you know, you got to use contraception, but it's better to not have sex. Like it's very, it, you know, it, it's, it's such a narrow limiting discussion that doesn't really inform anybody. Um, and I mean, I still see people who think the hymen is a thing. They think it's like a thing. Uh, you know, I did a video on it a few years ago and it had like 5 million views in like 24 hours. And people are like, what do you mean? It's not a thing. Like you don't have a freshness seal. Really, you don't. And it's, people can't wrap their heads around it. Like we should be teaching that. Like, I think the hymen is like the original myth. Like that's where like all the badness comes from. And I just think if we could maybe get rid of that one, that would be a good start. I couldn't agree more. And thanks to you and your video and what you've written about it in the Vagina Bible, I now include the hymen in my lecture to second year medical students. And I say, I never talked about this because it's not a thing. But apparently there's so much mythology. So you guys need to know the facts so that we don't perpetuate mythology. So I spend a little bit of time on it now. Whereas for the years before that, I was always like, not a thing. I'm not even going to mention it. But you know, I think 
but that's like a really good point. So we don't, you know, we study the things that we're like, hey, this is super important physiologically, and you need to know this anatomically, and you need to know, you know, so we know what you need to know to become a doctor. But we also need to know what people believe, right? Because people come in and you can't like in the office, you can't change their mind about something. And you're like, what is going on? Of course, it's because they have some belief about something. So you kind of, so it's exact. I'm so glad to hear you doing that because we have to prepare medical professionals for being able to meet people where they are and to be able to just say in casual conversation, you know, the hymen's not a thing, right? Just, just to let you know, it's like, you know, and because I bet you in your medical school class that you're teaching, there's a certain percentage who come in believing it absolutely is a thing. Absolutely. Uh, I, I totally agree that uh, we tend to lay emphasis on things that we think, you know, it, naturally it, it makes sense that these are important, but there are some things that we've taught for years or that people have assumed for years, but that they're really important, but that assumption just carries over and uh, right. it's, it's important that we mention them. Yeah, uh, no, I always say to people, you should be as obsessed about the hymen as you are about your baby teeth. Do you have those anymore? No. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a good one. So, Jen, um, we we at a stage in the in our podcast where I, I have to ask you, I think I, I can guess, but maybe I shouldn't assume. What's your favorite body part? Okay, so you're you're not gonna guess. It's it's actually nothing to do with um with uh <laughs> with with uh reproduction or menstrual cycle. It's the kidney. Oh my gosh, the kidney. Tell me more. The kidney. The kidney. Well, the kidney is what got me into medicine. So I, when I was younger, uh, when I was 11, I had a skateboarding accident and I ruptured my spleen. So, um, and as part of back in the day, this was in the 1970s, they had no CT scans or MRIs or any ultrasounds didn't even exist. And so I had to have an angiogram, like big, you know, needle put in my femoral artery to, you know, to put dye in my body and see what had happened. And um, this is how I actually got interested in medicine because I was a little precocious um, when I was 11 and I was very tall. So people thought I was older and, uh, and they didn't make me have an anesthetic. And I got to watch the whole angiogram, which I was super cool. I said, I can behave, I can behave. And um, during that angiogram, they found out I had kidney disease as well as the Russia sleep. So I had to have all this work up about my kidneys. And um, I ended up having to have a kidney removed when I was 11. And I've done my whole life on one kidney. Isn't that amazing? And because uh, it never really worked probably before. And your kidneys got you covered, man. You don't have to worry about your hydration. You don't have to worry about any of those things. Your kidney, your kidney is so smart. It's just like, just, just to, you know, treat your high blood pressure, um, you know, so you don't, you don't, disrespect your kidney that way. And, um, and that's it. Yeah. So I, I just, so the kidney got me into medicine and even though, and the physiology is so complex, it's so, it's, it's crazy complex. And you think that evolved, that's like, that's, and then all different animals have such unique kidneys because of the like environments they're in. Like you've got animals live in salt water, like how it's just so different. Like in everybody, like a heart's a pump right? It's just a pump. It's a pump. The, the lungs ventilate, but like the kidney is so unique. If you live in a desert, if you live in a different, so it just, I don't know. I just find it's kind of like cool. I love that so much. For me, the kidney is a late love. Like I, as a medical student, I was terrified of the kidney yeah. <laughs> um, because of its complex physiology. I remember this seminal moment when I realized it was blood going in and pee coming out, you know, it's like, right because you get so caught up in all the different receptors and pathways and everything. And now I absolutely adore the kidney. Um, maybe not to the same extent as you do, but um, it's definitely an acquired love for me um, as well. <laughs> so with that as your favorite body part, what's your least favorite body part? Okay. The ear canal, because I cannot stand the smell of earwax. That is so funny. I think earwax is the grossest thing. Like I just, and people are like, really, really? That's what you think is gross? I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah. I, I just find like earwax, like, you know, a couple of times I've had to go in and have it removed and they show you what they take out. And I'm just like, do not show me that. 
Like I just, the idea that that came out of my body is just, and it was like next to my ear, next to my brain. I, yeah. So, so the ear canal, I'm just like, and I get that wax is important. I'm not like, you know, I know it's doing its job. I just don't want to see it. Well, that's, <laughs> um, I get that. <laughs> and so I get that. And yes, I've had that removed too several times and it is gross. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's very satisfying when it comes out because you're like, oh, oh, but then they're like, show it to you. And you're like, oh, don't, I don't, oh, keep that away from me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jen. This has been a fascinating experience talking to you, and we really appreciate that you took the time out of your busy uh, practice and schedule to talk to us today. So um, on behalf of myself and uh, B, who is behind the scenes, and Claudia, just thank you so much. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm, it was a really a fun chat, and um, I hope we get to do it again sometime. All right, everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today and we'll catch up with you again on our next episode of Body Banter. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.